welcome everybody. Let's officially do the starting bit. Uh, here we have very handily an outline of this event on overseas development finance and the climate emergency. Um, we're going to, I'm going to very briefly introduce the project and then we'll, we'll um, go to Peter Sims who will set out more about that. Um, and then uh, Jonathan Essex, Dorothy Grace Gregoria and uh, Sylvia Ruger. Um, and there'll be plenty of time for discussion, plenty of time for Q&A. So just a reminder that the early bird definitely gets the worm. Um, we we'll get their questions in early. Um, we'll try to get to everybody, but you've got a much better chance when questions occur to you, please do post them. I hardly feel like I need to do this now, but, uh, but anyway, um, I think everyone probably knows where to find the chat box now. Um, please um, uh, make sure that you're on mute if you're not speaking. Um, you know, we all love to hear from your cat, your dog or your children, but possibly you might want us to hear that. So uh, make sure we've got all that covered. Um, to introduce myself, first of all, um, I'm Natalie Bennett, Green Party member of the House of Lords, where I've been for two years and still celebrating the fact that two weeks ago we actually won our first ever vote in the House of Lords um, as the Green Party. Uh, we added soils to the priority areas in the Environment Bill <coughs> and the fight is now on to, I had a meeting earlier today to, uh, to keep that which is kind of of quite considerable relevance uh, to today when we start to think about climate finance, the kind of money that's needed, the investment that's needed for tackling the climate emergency, both adaptation and mitigation, but also of course to think about food security, which is very much a pressing issue of the age with food prices uh, really soaring at the moment. So that's um, me, and if you so you don't sit there wondering, the accent comes from Australia uh, originally, um, and my first degree is agricultural science, which makes me quite unusual in politics, which is why I can get quite geeky about soils. But I won't do that um, today, just to outline the fact that we, you know, to remind you of the fact that um, the Q and A is where the questions go. The chat also, please, participants. Um, it's great to know where people are coming in from and what. Kind of direction or area of interest they have. So please introduce yourself in the chat, um, say your name, if there's a, a, a institutional affiliation that's relevant, um, and maybe what brings you to this evening, what your interests are. So please feel free to chat in the chat and try and keep the questions in the Q&A, which will make my job as, as chair a lot easier. Um, what we're looking for is an open discussion about the pros and cons of different approaches to aid and climate finance all ideas are welcome. Um, so that's a space that's your space, really. So just to explain that this is part of a three year project run by the Greenhouse Think Tank and the Green European Foundation. And Peter Sims is going to tell us a bit about the project. Peter's an electronic engineer who specializes in systems engineering and coordinates the Climate Emergency Economy Project for Greenhouse. So over to you, Peter. Hello. Um, so yes, I, I'm just going to give a brief overview of the Climate Emergency Economy Project, uh, which Greenhouse has been running for two years now, and that this webinar is part of that project. Um, so it's a transnational product project. We have partners from multiple countries. Uh, the Green Union Pound Foundation is running it at a U European level, and then UK the Greenhouse Think Tank is the UK partner. Uh, the focus is on what an uh, uh, what the economy would need to look like. Um, uh, for the climate emergency? How do we need to re reshape our economy for the, in response to climate change? Um, so the so just going to flag some recent publications. So um, earlier this year, we uh, published something on transport investment, and that was looking at transport investment in the UK, but also within the EU. And then this event is leading on from that to look at, well, how, how does the EU and the UK invest in transport investment overseas? Uh, and then this also... Uh, prior to that, we did a load of work around uh, the zero carbon toolkit of enablers and blockers and looking at what the, the how that linked to trade and investment and infrastructure and to the social and environmental requirements of the climate emergency economy. Um, there are various resources on our website. Um, to, the, I mentioned the toolkit, but there's also stuff to do with a breakdown of trade statistics. Um, you, uh, I'll put those links will be in the chat. Um, and then I'll just briefly outline the pillars before we move on to the main speakers tonight. So there's three pillars of this uh, project. Uh, there's the, the UK stuff around investment and transport infrastructure. There's some work being led by our partner in the Netherlands on the role of hydrogen in the climate emergency economy. 
And then there's some work being uh, done by between Ireland and Poland, looking at food sovereignty and, re and regional resilience. Um, but this full, this event full, full, falls within the transport and investment um, pillar. Uh, I will pass back to Natalie. Thanks very much, Peter, for that very short, short and sweet introduction. Uh, just for anyone who doesn't know, the Green European Foundation is the umbrella group for all of the um, green think tanks foundations uh, right across Europe. Uh, I suppose I should declare an interest here in that I'm actually on the um, board of the Green European Journal, which is published by the foundation, and I'm going to stick a little advert uh, of a link to that journal um, in the, um, the box in a second. And I know a number of people on this call have, uh, have contributed to that and been involved in that. Um, and it's a really great resource that um, I'd urge you to have a look at when you get a chance. Uh, so moving on now to our first speaker, Jonathan Essex. Jonathan is a chartered engineer and environmentalist who's worked for engineering consultants and contractors in the UK, Bangladesh and Vietnam. His work has included developing strategies for a social enterprise eco park, promoting materials reuse and decarbonizing the UK construction and housing industries. He's also a green councillor in Surrey, and I've visited him several times there um, in seeing some of the work that he does there. He's going to introduce some of the, the findings from a report that he's writing for Greenhouse on the UK and EU investment in transport infrastructure. Over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much, uh, Natalie. So what I was going to do is just introduce the, the, the issue of climate change, um, focus a little bit on transport, and then give some wider thoughts, which, which hopefully will link into the wider discussion as we move on. So just to start with, I think that now we've, we've got a situation where most people are understanding that there is a climate change that we have to face up to. But the question is whether the policies, the economics and the actions around the world are really transforming themselves at, at the scale and the speed that's, that are needed to deal with, with the challenge ahead of us. And uh, next slide, please. And I think to do that in, to, in the context of international development as, as well, but you know, even more so than in one country, we need to look at the equality aspects and how that affects individual people's lives alongside looking at the climate change aspect. So, you know, if we reduce the amount of resources to that which are, are, exist across the planet, you can think of ourselves like the cake. Well, you know, there's going to be less cake, um, less resources and energy uh, spent each year. So we need to really make sure that's that's shared out fairly and, and everyone has a has a chance to get hold of some of that and, and use it to have good sustainable livelihoods especially those who can't raise their voices for themselves next slide please so i mean this is the wider context i mean that there is that there is growing gdp per capita um, in the rich countries but the gap is 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 growing between the high and the low income countries around the world and, and while while that gap is growing while gdp is increasing we are exceeding our planetary boundaries um, across the world. And, and, and that's the context. We need to somehow reduce that trend of growing inequality and at the same time come back within the planetary boundaries of which climate change is perhaps the, the most urgent, which accelerates the, the challenge for everything else. The next slide, please. So I'm going to uh, focus on two things here. Uh, firstly, the, the case for transport, infrastructure investment to change, uh, and, and also how that might relate to a, a wider context for climate finance and international development. Next slide, please. So in terms of transport, uh, the trends are quite clear. You know, road transport by 2012 was already a fifth of global carbon emissions. And without any action, that will accelerate at least double by 2050. Um, the fastest growth is in um, the, the, the lowest income countries, particularly in Asia and Africa. The biggest increase to 2050 is in the middle income countries, but even so, the emissions per capita by 2050 would still be three times higher in the high income countries. So this is really something that needs to bring us all together and we all need to act in different ways on this issue. Next slide, please. Um, so the future perhaps is, is this um, from SLOWCAT, the Sustainable um, Low Carbon Transport Partnership um, around the world. And they, they say we need to avoid the need for transport shift to zero carbon transport modes like walking and cycling and, and public transport and then improve if you like electrify um, the the private vehicles that remain that, that's incredibly difficult for aviation and shipping but at least it's possible for a car uh, next slide please so what's happening um, uh, the picture here is a, of the the, the Hargeza bypass um, an, an access road in, in, in Somalia. This is a, a massive construction project and is quite typical of the kind of things that's still being invested on 
around the world. So I'm, I'm going to run through a, a couple of areas here. Firstly, policy. Um, what does policy look like? Uh, and then what does spending look like in the UK, in terms of UK export finance, and then for the EU? So firstly, policy, where are we? Next slide. Um, well, the European Investment Bank says that they could withdraw support for new airports, um, according to a draft climate roadmap, but it hasn't happened yet. So investments are still continuing in the old way, investing in the same things which will damage the, damage the climate. Next, next slide, please. The European Bank for Reconstruction and Development produced its new transport strategy in 2019, and it's, I think this is quite typical of where we are in terms of policy. You know, on the one hand, we'll have growth. On the other hand, we'll have action on climate. But the reality is when, when, when you actually come to funding something, growth still seems to prevail. So for roads, there's no clear climate ambition there, but we want to still expand roads. Next slide. For rail, um, there is clear efforts and, and investment in decarbonising rail, in electrifying rail around the world. But that's alongside expanding the scale of, of, of rail and the speed uh, uh, availability for long distance transport there. Next slide. Um, shipping and aviation are, are quite, but quite curious. Uh, maritime is increasing source of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so we'll need to replace our fleets and expand our ports and infrastructure and services. That's actually strategy. And then similarly for aviation, next slide. Um, uh, we'll support low cost and regional airlines uh, and expand and improve air connectivity while recognizing that aviation is one of the fastest growing emitters of climate change in the world. Well, isn't that basically a strategy to say, carry on doing what we're doing while recognizing there's a problem with this? They they've, they've accepted there's a problem in the strategy, but not to the extent that they want to change the investment. So how does that focus uh, re be reflected into current investments in current spending and infrastructure. Next slide. Oh, just one, one more thing was, was um, UK export finance. This is the, the guarantees that the UK gives for overseas private investment. They reduce, produced a, a new climate strategy last week, presumably um, to coincide with us hosting uh, the, the, the climate conference in, in Glasgow in November. And, and, and they have a strategic pillar for reducing greenhouse gas emissions and, and and that uses phrases such as building our understanding setting in interim targets although they aren't actually in this this strategy itself implementing government policy on clean energy transition um, continuing to take climate change considerations into account and seeking to reduce emissions where appropriate so so maybe the guide on what they plan to do in the future is on why the investments are today so i think let's move on and and, and, and have a look at where we are currently spending money on transport infrastructure from the UK and EU. Next slide, please. The, the numbers are big. So across the EU, five billion a year is spent on transport infrastructure. Uh, that doesn't include um, services, so, so buses and so forth. This is investment in new vehicles, uh, new rail, new roads, new airports, expanded ports and so on. For the UK, there's currently half a billion at least in, in current transport projects. Um, and, and, and the projects are, are, are massive. Um, so the top 10 uh, European Bank for Reconstruction Development included, you know, massive road building projects, airports, ports, rail electrification and so forth. Next slide, please. And, and, and some, similarly for, for the, for the e EU. Next slide. So what does that look like in terms of projects in detail? In terms of UK export finance, just to highlight three, um, on the right is the, the one that's been in the news a lot. Um, nearly a, a billion uh, pounds in, in, in guarantees for a, a new LPG terminal in Mozambique. But what's, what's less known is that it's US export finance that's funding an airstrip that's making that happen. So, you know, multiple sectors tied together. On the left-hand side is, is, a, is a picture of a, a plan to link an oil refinery to an industrial park to a, a new airport. Um, and, and, and then in the middle, the, uh, another, another in the airport that's linked to, and underneath is a caption for Ghana. So the, these three projects, Uganda, Mozambique and Ghana. And Ghana, we're building a new terminal to facilitate the export of fresh agricultural products, such as shea butter, cashew nuts and mangoes by air. So the UK is investing in airports to encourage air freight of very high carbon intensive goods. This is the most carbon intensive form of development you can have but yet it claims to have a climate strategy and policy which is, is in touch with. Next slide, please. Um, in terms of the UK investment in transport, uh, 
Um, there, there are shifts, there are different projects coming forward, but the largest project, and it's 265 million pounds of investment, is for a road corridor in Pakistan. And, and interestingly, the annual review there from 2019 says this is to drive regional trade and economic growth. You'd think aid was all to do with poverty reduction, but actually a lot of the support for road infrastructure and transport infrastructure is very much on, on this ideal that somehow you can invest in trade, productivity and growth, and somehow that will trickle down to benefit the poorest in society. I think that's a myth that, that others might explore further on, the, on this meeting tonight. Next slide, please. And let's look briefly at the EBRD. Um, the top one, um, new trains in Egypt. Electrification, improved efficiency could be a good thing. Second one, um, massive road corridor in Kazakhstan, um, presumably linked to um, resource extraction in some way, and liquidity support through COVID to Moroccan airports. These are large amounts of money. Um, hard to see how the, the poverty reduction element um, is, is, is big in at least the last two. Um, let alone carbon reduction. Next slide, please. So um, the three largest in the European Commission are a multi-sector uh, transport program in Turkey, road building in Haiti, and then rehabilitation of a road in the Congo. So again, you can see big infrastructure and roads featuring quite highly in our infrastructure investment. So the pitch here for roads is quite simple. I, mean, I think if we, if we as donors of rich countries are going to stop investing in taking oil and gas and coal out of the ground, we should also stop investing in the things that increase the need to burn that oil, coal and gas and change our aid to focus away from this heavy, dirty infrastructure towards ways where we can decarbonize societies and address poverty at the same time. Next slide, please. So this is just then to close some facts about climate finance. Um, these are some, some numbers, others may have different numbers and, and want to comment on them. So firstly, we as a globe have committed to the Sustainable Development Goals. The amount of money to deliver them um, is absolutely huge. You're talking about 4, 15% of GDP. In terms of existing overseas development aid, um, currently 0.32% of GNI globally. If it was actually the 0.7% that those donor countries agreed to back in 1970, that would be a further 193 billion a year. The new climate finance pledge in 2009 was another 100 billion, so it doesn't even bridge the shortfall in current overseas development assistance, let, let, let alone give anything else for climate. Next slide, please. So what about that climate finance? I'm sure we'll hear a lot more of this in the run-up to COP and at COP itself this, this autumn. It was pledged back in 2009 as a target for 2020. Um, but the rules on what it constituted were invented by the OECD without participation in the countries that were gonna benefit. It was intended to be a collective commitment to provide new and additional resources. And it was supposed to be a progression beyond what was currently donated. But analysis this year showed that currently we haven't met that target and nearly half of the money given wasn't additional at all. It was just money that was already committed, already in the bank. Next slide, please. So how does that relate to the UK? Well, the UK provided 0.7% um, of our GNI in 2019 and 20, albeit less in 20, because the overall size of the economy have reduced. Um, the additional climate finance over and above overseas development assistance from the UK was zero. All of the climate finance is existing ODA, which is allocated and claimed to be international climate finance too. So it's the same pound of money allocated twice to different international commitments. We've then reduced our ODA this year to 0.5%. So there's less aid, and within that less aid, there's the same amount of climate finance. So presumably we're moving money around, presumably a bit more on health, um, presumably um, we're still spending money on roads, that's clear. But what's happening elsewhere? Um, but yet we claim in the UK to be, um, you know, leading and wanting others to follow our lead. Well, it seems to be that, you know, this claim of increasing climate spend means, you know, is all it means is we're increasingly mainstreaming climate across our existing aid portfolio, which is getting smaller. We aren't actually committing anything extra in terms of climate finance. Next slide. So, so my, my pitch, and, and this is sort of maybe open to discussion and comments really, is that firstly, we should, climate finance should be what it said it was, additional to the overseas development 
um, uh, you know, assistance that we provide. This is about technical assistance, it's about sharing of money and resources to help other countries and have international cooperation on this issue. We can't label the same thing and say we've done it. And, and that needs to be increased to address the scale of the emergency you know, in line with the sustainable development goals. We need to bring everyone on side and do the whole job properly. And that means a, re a rethink about how we think of climate finance and how much climate finance we give. And that's all I was gonna say. So I'll hand it over to others. Thank you. Thanks very much, Jonathan, for that uh, very comprehensive, if somewhat depressing, I'd have to say, picture. And speaking as someone who spends quite a bit of time in the house, um, very much complaining about the, um, the uh, cut uh, in the breaking of the Tories manifesto promise, the breaking, many people think, of UK law, which had 0.7% of GNP going as aid um, as, as, as the law. Um, is uh, an issue that uh, will keep coming back as to keep hitting us as chair of COP26. So let, let's hope we might see some more positive things uh, along the way. Um, and I'm sure we will from Dorothy Grace Grigaya, who's the head of policy and advocacy at Global Justice Now, an internationalist with over 25 years experience in activism, research and development work. Originally from the Philippines, she's lived and worked in the global South and North previously working with the Transnational Institute, African Women United Against Destructive Resource Extraction, uh, focus on the Global South, which is a, a, an Asian regional organization, Asian House Deutschland, and the Institute for Popular Democracy in the Philippines. She's also worked as a guest lecturer in MA development programs in universities in Asia and Germany. So Dorothy is going to talk about some of the ways in which international finance contributes to the climate emergency and climate injustice. So maybe not so cheerful, but I'm sure we'll get to some cheerful bits of it eventually. Thanks very much, Dorothy, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Natalie. Uh, well, when it comes to, to looking at the politics or, or the climate politics and then where climate finance and debt and aid and trade uh, um, comes together, um, I, I'm afraid I'm, I, this will be another doom and gloom. And, and, and um, the, there are some rays of hope, but uh, it will, we have to work on that together. So I, I think I will, I will start on, on what uh, Jonathan mentioned about the $100 billion climate finance, which was promised um, for, to developing countries. Well, the, the, the irony of this is that when that was discussed in the in COP uh, fifteen in Copenhagen, it's not based on anything. It's 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 coming out from a hat that the U.S. government uh, pulled pulled off, so that developing countries will will not um, um, you know we will not uh, make a big fuss during the Copenhagen um, summit, and then it was approved in Cancun. But the thing is that. There's no basis for 100, the $100 billion. And also, the target of starting from 2020 uh, is too little compared to the, to, the, to the real amount that we need uh, to address the climate emergency. And way, way, and way back then, um, I agree that it's little. And at the same time, there's nothing new in that. And in fact, most of them are not given as grant. They were actually given as as, uh, as loans, which many developing countries would still have to pay for. So, so I we see in global justice now a really intimate connections or relationship between the way that the global finance, global trade, uh, and, and the climate, uh, the, the disproportionate way that we are addressing or governments are addressing the climate emergency with what's currently on the table. So if, if we look last week, um, one, of the, one of the positives is that since there is another COP and it will be hosted by the UK, then there's a lot that is happening discussing about um, what's the target, what will be the nationally determined contribution, What's what's um, what are the challenges in coming up with the appropriate climate finance? So these are all in the picture. And to add that in the last two years, the climate emergency is also in the you know it came to the dining table discussions thanks to the 
through the relentless activism of groups like the Fridays for Futures, the XR, uh, and, and all those direct action groups that have, ma that have managed to push this discussion on the family discussion. Uh, I've been following the Conference of Parties since, since it was held in Bali. Um, although I did not attend all the, all the COPs, uh, probably I attended six. The COP26 in Glasgow will be my seventh. But the on and off, and also looking at the debates, what is really frustrating is the fact that what's on the table is nothing uh, compared to the appropriate needs of developing countries. And at the same time, the, um, the responsibility of rich countries like those uh, here in the UK and also in, in the global north, that what we what what we call as a global north. Um, last well, um, uh, last August there was this um, first of the four part, the six assessment report of the Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, and it's another code red of the many. Uh, there are so many code red coming from one uh, from the hill of the last code red, and. Um, unless drastic cuts in emissions are made, then we will not really, we will breach the 1.5 limit by around 2030. So that's a decade earlier than projected. And, and also we have less than a decade to respond to the climate emergency. So in reality, there is, um, there is a big problem between how we are addressing the climate and, and, and uh, what we are, what we are um, committing to what the different countries are committing to. Last week in the UN General Assembly, uh, UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres addressed uh, the body, uh, the, the, the General Assembly and said that rich countries should inject an additional $1 trillion or 736 billion of funds to avoid a twin track recovery that widens the gap with the world's poorest nations. Even before the pandemic, there is already a problem of um, uh, uh, really problematic health services in the developing countries. And that is linked to another problem of debt, of, of, of paying the foreign debt. Many of the global South countries automatically allocate a huge chunks of their national budget annually to pay those debts. And, and that um, at currently with a global debt of more than 4.74 million people and still rising, COVID-19 has also wiped out years of progress in the 15-year global work on the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, which has a target of 2030. And um, already in 2019, it is already off track. So with the, with the pandemic and then also the, um, the increase in the, the, the impacts of climate change, that, that, will, that will further be a challenge. So we are indeed facing uh, the most serious global public health, climate and economic crisis, which will worsen existing inequalities and threaten the long-term livelihoods and well-being of hundreds of millions, um, if not billions of people, without a greater determination by rich nations to share resources. But sharing resources or talking about aid should not, should not be based on charity because uh, the gap between the rich and poor nations, uh, as I mentioned earlier, it widened further due to different access to vaccines. Um, rich countries like the UK, Germany, Switzerland are still blocking the, the TRIPS waiver request from India and South Africa and, and still favoring the interests of transnational corporations to monopolize the, the, the recipe for COVID vaccine, when in fact there are capacity for many, for many developing countries to manufacture their own. So this hypocrisy of insisting on donating vaccines when in fact we should just agree with the, with the TRIPS waiver which only includes COVID-related um, knowledge and, and, and also services. Uh, so that will come quite heavy again by the middle of October in the next formal meeting of the World Trade Organization. So why, why am I saying this? Also because um, if we look at how the wealth of billionaires increased by over 3.9 trillion between March and December alone, the impact of the pandemic on workers, among other factors, you will really see the big gap. The, 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 the situation produced 
um, a higher number of extremely poor, between 119 and 224 million people, uh, which is the first time, the first such increase in poverty in over 21 years. So all these efforts of two decades of development work is wiped out by the pandemic. And um, as long as we don't really embrace the fact that if we come to our society here in the North, no advanced economy has achieved economic and social progress without investing in social protection systems. And that is what is being taken from the Global South by insisting that they owe the North a huge amount of foreign debt. So I'm putting all this together. It's, it's quite a challenge. I know it's impossible for the 10 minutes that, that was given to me. So it is. Uh, it should still be an increasing debate how our foreign aid um, should be spent, what it should be spent on and why. For too long, aid spending has been driven by notions of charity, national self-interest uh, uh, especially, and an, an, an ideological belief that the free markets and multinational business can solve the world's problems. The UK aid spending is, being, is still being shaped by a government with a preference for privatization, big business, and free market models of development. And that's not just the UK. I mean, if we would look at most of the OECD countries, this is still driving um, the politics and the policy on aid. The push for privatization uh, heightened uh, structural economic inequalities. And that structural economic inequalities play a significant role in determining who lives and who dies in this crisis. And then I'm attributing both uh, the climate crisis and also the health crisis that we are that we are uh, facing now. So, so this uh, problem uh, is what we can see as the underlying condition why um, the current approach to aid is problematic. Um, in our 2017 report, it showed that. It's not that the, the aid is not enough or falling into, into um, projects which it should not fall into, but that large amount of aid is being outsourced to for-profit private contractors. Uh, some of them are being um, sourced or being, 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 um, um, being put on putting malls or private uh, schools or things like that, which means that the beneficiaries of aid spending are, are also the, the actors, the very same actors, and we're supporting the, the process where privatization of uh, services will heighten, which is contrary to what um, a progressive vision of aid should be, because it should first and foremost um, encourage democracy in, in countries, uh, it, it should encourage redistribution of economic and political power in the world as well. So how can we reimagine um, uh, a, 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 a truly progressive aid? So when I mentioned global wealth redistribution in a similar way uh, in the national level, so in the global level, it, it, it means it should aid societies to have some mechanisms for redistributing wealth from the richest to the poorest. Also, aid can be considered as a form of compensation. The developed world has grown rich over many centuries by pulling resources out of developing countries. It, it's whether through the extraction of natural resources or uh, tax avoidance by Western corporations or ignoring the impacts of climate change, as well as uh, pushing neoliberal economic reforms uh, to countries that, that have no means to to, to say no to those economic reforms. So this is this axis of, of indebtedness, of the presence of transnational cooperation, and of course, the North-South politics. Um, I would like to add one last point, which is part of our campaign as well, because although we are talking about A, the reality is when, it, when we come to the matters that have teeth, and that is trade, this is another discrepancy because when we say we are facing climate emergency, in reality, we also have the Energy Charter Treaty. We also have uh, the investment state dispute settlement, which is in the investment provisions of all free trade agreements that, that the UK is pushing globally and that the EU is signing and peddling to the developing world. 
what is what is the ISDS but or, or the corporate court as we call it it is a means to give power to transnational corporations to to even sue governments when they are doing climate actions so here you are the the social movements in many developing countries pushing their governments to say no to mega development projects that are actually frying the climate and pushing them to more mal development and then and then uh, when they finally, after long years of struggle, decades of struggle, when they finally say, okay, we will stop coal uh, production, we will stop uh, extracting fossil fuels, the transnational corporations can actually sue them for millions of dollars because it will impact on their investments. So putting together the issue of, of trade and aid and finance and the climate target, yeah, it, it's crazy because we really have a political economy that is incompatible to policies that are being pushed by the by, by the more uh, um, the, the, the more powerful countries in all these international relations. So I think I will I will end there and and with a call as well that we really need to discuss also about the cancellations because otherwise. The developing countries will continue to be poor because they have to put more and more money or borrow more and more money to address the climate emergency. Uh, sorry, if this doesn't sound cohesive. I'm, I'm just like enumerating one problem after another. So where's where's hope here? Um, uh, I think the hope relies on, lies on the fact that there are really many campaigns, national level and global levels, and also there's more and more uh, movements and campaign organizations that are looking at the political economy, looking at the politics of AIDS, looking at climate finance. And um, despite the fact that the South is already marginalized even before COP26 started, because they could not travel to the UK due to the red listing uh, of the UK government and many of them are not vaccinated. It's a call, we need to call for many, many uh, groups to be in Glasgow and, and demand uh, an appropriate climate finance uh, that, that should be realized this time, not postponed and, and should be increased. When, when countries talk about their, 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 their um, fair share, it should include a drastic emission or cuts in their emissions and bigger climate finance. So that will only be a just way to, to say that we are leading in the, in the climate, addressing climate change. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dorothy, for that enormously powerful um, presentation with a huge amount packed into it. And I think when we're thinking about climate finance, I think I might borrow a, borrow a, a phrase from the disability uh, campaigners and say, you know, the global south needs to be saying a no decision about us without us um, being involved and engaged. Um, now, for the audience, um, You've heard two very powerful presentations now, both looking at different ways in which aid money is being used in the global north. So a question which we're asking you to share any thoughts um, in the chat, any, any responses that you might have to the question is why do countries give overseas development finance? You'll see it's up there on the slide. Um, so the invitation is to provide your response to that. And I think perhaps also implicit in that question is why should countries give overseas development finance? And it may well be that your answers answer to the should and the do are somewhat different. Um, and there's uh, perhaps some more questions to put to our panelists to put to Dorothy. And remember, there's also the Q&A box there. Um, and you know, just reflecting on some of the things that, that um, Dorothy said, um, you know, when you're looking at COVID-19, I think at times the message has got through um, that uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. And that's true with COVID, but it's also true when you think about the state of the world. Um, pandemics is just one issue. And before COVID-19, there was a great deal of concern about Ebola, which was starting to break out of, out of West Africa in particular uh, and spread around the world. There's a huge number of threats out there. And of course, the climate threat as well. So. Um, which brings us on to the second question. Again, please do put comments in the chat box, which is how can cooperation between countries and climate finance best enable an equitable 1.5 degree world? So I think here we, the first question was what is or should be happening. Here is turning it around the other way and saying, what does, what does good, what does, 
adequate for this climate emergency, this nature crisis, this world where we're choked with plastics, um, this world where um, some people are hypermobile, particularly since Jonathan was focusing on transport, while other people are absolutely you know, stuck. And one of the most powerful presentations I ever heard on climate refugees pointed out that everyone focuses on seeing the problem of people moving. Um, it's really important to also think that for some people not being able to move in a climate emergency is a matter of life and death. And that's something to think about as well. So there's a lot to be going on in there in the chat. But in the meantime, uh, we're moving on to our third speaker. Uh, and I'd like to introduce Sylvia Brugger, who's a political scientist with a master's in intercultural communication and international law and a climate change expert. She currently works for the Euroclimate Plus program, coordinating the climate governance component on behalf of, oh, now you're going to have to pro, pro, apologise for my German accent here, Deutsche Gesellschaft für International Zumenzeit GmbH, that might be easier. Um, she has been an advisor of the technical assistance program in the previous phase of Euroclima and director of the sustainable development and climate change program in the Heinrich Boll Foundation in Brussels. She has experience in political and economic transformation in Latin America and the Caribbean and has worked at the Center for Applied Policy Research in Munich. She's gonna talk about how donors can support governments to address the threat of climate change and give some examples from the Euro Climate Project. So finally, here we are to be cheerful. We're getting to the to the positive bit. Um, some good news stories. Over to you, Sylvia. Thanks so much, and uh, thanks again for the invitation. Um, I, it's for me really a pleasure to be here joining this webinar. A, a little bit returning to, if you want, to my roots. I worked, um, as, as was just said, in the Heinrich Böll Foundation, as uh, some of you might know. This is the Green Political from the Foundation of uh, from the German uh, Green Party. Uh, now I work with GIZ, uh, which is the German Development Cooperation Agency. Um, so I have a little bit uh, left the, the, the Green uh, Party uh, surroundings, but of course I'm still close uh, with my heart and thoughts. Uh, it's very interesting to come back and connect uh, with the discussions you're having, which I think are very interesting. So um, I would uh, like to make use of the next couple of minutes to just briefly share a couple of insights from my work on how international cooperation can support governments to address climate change. I think this last question that was posted, I, I think this was really interesting, a little bit from the kind of uh, constructive uh, uh, side, looking at how actually cooperation can uh, best enable an equitable 1.5 degree world. So here I bring in my practical experience from the work with GIZ and in particular with this Euroclima Plus program. Um, uh, I'm going to go very quickly over the, the first couple of slides because I think a lot of the information that I had intended to, to present here was already in one way or the other um, uh, touched upon. So just very briefly with the, if you can just uh, go to the next slide, please. Um, I wanted to again kind of uh, stress how urgent it is um, to increase the climate ambition. As some of you might have heard just very recently, um, the UNFCCC had released its NDC synthesis report, which is um, actually really worrying. You can see this graph below under this uh, graph from this uh, report that shows that um, the, there's a substantial gap that remains between the levels of emissions uh, in the in the that are projected uh, in the current NDCs, and the lower levels would be consistent with the temperature limits of the Paris Agreement. So there's really an urgent need to increase ambition and um, to, uh, to to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to practically zero by 2050. This is what is needed. The other argument that I wanted to make here or to stress is that um, the, the what was also already mentioned by Jonathan that uh, equality aspects, um, poverty. Um, is linked strongly with the uh, with the climate crisis. So we um, can already see that uh, the world's most vulnerable populations are facing um, often uh, the biggest risks. Um, and uh, there are estimates, for instance, from the UN that climate change could drive an additional 100 million people into poverty by 2030. Um, I'm not going to go into the different elements that are. Uh, relevant factors here, such as extreme weather events uh, and so on. I think we're all aware of this. Um, 
maybe just uh, to, I also not going to go into this, the, the numbers of what is needed. I think we've also already heard this, the annual cost. I think there's many different numbers that are circulating. Um, Jonathan also already mentioned a few. I have now picked up those uh, uh, $500 billion. Uh, um, and there's actually even higher uh, estimates of what is needed um, in to, uh, to, to adapt and to mitigate the climate change. Um, so just uh, this, this, this last uh, bullet here to stress that we are now with the uh, COVID crisis and the effects of this um, facing even bigger uh, uh, challenges because there's quite some um, potential um, uh, negative impacts that some of the measures, recovery measures that have been taken or are being taken to respond to the impact of the COVID pandemic might have on the climate and the environment. So this um, kind of call for green recovery is, is, is for us also very important to try to make sure that the recovery packages set the course um, for long-term structure, structural reforms and this transformative shift towards a sustainability, also biodiversity protection, resilience and climate neutrality. But we see, of course, when we see the when, when the different green recovery trackers that are out there, that we are by far not there yet. And there's a lot more that is needed. So maybe just to the next slide. Um, I mean, there's uh, also, as was mentioned several times, again, the 100 billion uh, pledge, but there's also other commitments internationally as part of the Paris Agreement to um, provide uh, support uh, to the most vulnerable uh, and less endowed um, countries to, the, um, to, 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 the, to adapt to the impacts of climate change and to reduce emissions. So these are like these three different aspects that probably many of you know. So just I wanted to stress that beyond the climate finance, which is here in this discussion very much on the forefront, there's also the aspects that are relevant of uh, technology transfer and capacity building, which um, the last element capacity building is a main uh, um, element of what we are doing with the Euro Clima Plus program that I will go into in a moment. Um, so uh, I think I will already uh, just go to the next slide. Uh, I'm sharing here a very, uh, I don't know if you can see this, it's, it's a bit small, you might have seen this before. It's also, it's actually the latest uh, version I found. Um, it's numbers from 2017, 2018, but I think it's nevertheless an interesting overview because it gives a kind of an idea of what climate finance actually entails because we often talk about climate finance and um, we heard the grant finance we heard that there's loans we heard there's this private um, money and uh, i think this gives a kind of a nice uh, overview of where the money comes from which kind of the other means the instruments and what are the the different sectors that might be um that might be benefiting from this different finance Flows. So I think this is um, uh, interesting to look into, but uh, what I actually want to um, stress here is that the development finance institutions and multilateral development banks um, play a key role in this uh, in, in our climate finance and European Investment Bank, uh, as one example, it had already been mentioned by Jonathan before, has just recently adopted its so-called climate bank roadmap. So uh, there are um, there is some ambition there um, in concrete terms. The bank has committed itself to increase its level of support to climate action, environmental sustainability to exceed 50% of its overall lending activity by 2025 and beyond, and thus help to leverage 1 trillion euros of investment. But maybe um, the, the, other, the other thing is also important uh, that there's this do no harm uh, principle uh, that has been adopted. And I think it would be interesting to keep on analyzing that. As we heard from Jonathan, there's uh, still a lot of money going into um, projects that, that actually lock in uh, a kind of uh, uh, dirty investments. And there's um, now this new principle to say that, that, that the bank should ensure that all its activities do no significant harm to the goals of the Paris Agreement. And there's actually other banks that have adopted similar policies and principles um, and try to embed sustainability into their lending activities. Um, however, also, uh, I think it's important to stress that uh, when we look into the kind of estimates of what, the, um, what it will cost to, to really um, transform uh, uh, our economies and societies towards a more climate uh, kind of compatible pathway, um, the public funds will not be enough uh, to close this gap. And so leveraging private investment um, is important um, and making thus most effective use of those limited resources um, as, for example, grant finance. Um, so um, I think also in this regard, the Paris Agreement Article 2.10C, I think it is, 
um, is quite an important uh, uh, novelty that uh, because they're beyond, let's say, the, 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 the billion pledge and climate finance as such, um, there's the there's a, there's a signal to, or there's a, there's, a, there's a commitment to ensure that finance flows, all finance flows um, are consistent with a pathway towards low carbon climate resilient development. So um, I think we always have to have the kind of the comparison between the brown or green or well, there's different terms on that, but um, to look at all of the finance flows, both public and private, domestic, international. And in that regard, also, I would like to mention just the, the importance of the that I see uh, in this EU sustainable finance regulations, the taxonomy that for sure can be improved and should be improved, but that's uh, quite a, can be an important element to enable investors to reorient investments towards more sustainable technologies and businesses. So um, then also uh, I would uh, already like to switch to the next uh, slide. So just very briefly now zooming into a very practical example of um, an international cooperation program that I'm working on targeted at climate change in Latin America. Um, this is called Euroclima Plus. Um, Euroclima Plus is the EU's flagship cooperation program um, on climate change in the Latin American region and is funded by the EU and also co-financed by the German government through its Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, as well as the governments of France and Spain. The program is implemented um, by agencies of the EU member states from Spain, France, and also including GIZ from Germany, and the UN with the uh, ECLAC and UN environment. And its objective is to reduce the impact of climate change and its effects on Latin America, and it carried out, carries out actions that are considered of strategic importance for the implementation of NDCs. Um, another important element is the support of the interregional and bi-regional dialogue and cooperation on climate issues within Latin America and also between Latin America and the EU. So um, just going to the next slide, um, I want to just flag out a couple of aspects of the Euroclima Plus uh, program approach. Uh, one aspect is um, our kind of work modality on how we define actions. Um, so uh, the actions that um, we carry out are uh, identified in very close coordination with the national, so-called national focal points that we have in each partner country. Um, so national focal points are representatives that the governments of the 18 Latin American countries have designated to facilitate and guide the implementation of the program. Often they're vested within the environment ministries and we um, then def define those um, needs and priorities of the partner countries in a participatory manner in the so-called country dialogues, um, or in Spanish, Dialogos País. I'm sorry that the craft is only in Spanish, but I couldn't find an English version. Um, so this country dialogue is basically a long-term engagement process between uh, the program and the partner country in Latin America that helps strengthen the NC implementation, and it serves to identify a country's demand for the Euroclima services and to take also stock of progress and support update of plans and priorities for NDC implementation or update processes. Um, just very briefly, so there's six typical steps that we've established in this country dialogue methodology. Of course, we always adapt this to the specific context, um, but it uh, typically uh, starts from a formal country request and a rapid country context analysis to understand the legal and institutional climate change design and to map key stakeholders and potential synergies with other um, relevant initiatives. And then Euroclima Plus and the partner country may agree to design and organize a multi-stakeholder consultation process that will result in identification and prioritization of potential actions. During the programming phase, then the prioritized support requests are analyzed according to programs criteria and matched with the Euroclima supply response, building on the combined expertise of the seven implementing agencies. And this matching exercise will then be translated into a so-called country action plan that uh, is agreed between the Euroclima program and the partner country, which is a very flexible instrument that um, guides implementation and monitoring of the action. So overall, this country dialogue mechanism that we have established um, within the Euroclima program allows us to act in a very flexible and context-specific manner based on the demands of the partner countries in Latin America and building on a strong country ownership through the key role also that our national focal points have in the coordination of these processes. So just going to the next one, another element that I would like to highlight um, is that the program is going beyond uh, a monothematic approach or functional interventions as it works in many different areas. Um, 
and sectors related uh, to climate change and sustainable development. We heard about mainstreaming before and the additionality um, uh, issues. So um, without now responding directly to this, uh, but I just want to flag out that, they, that we are covering um, many different uh, action lines and, and sectors which allows us to facilitate transformative processes and integrated approaches and to think um, not only in, in line of decarbonization, but also um, integrate other aspects um, without now uh, going all the details here, uh, but uh, we have this cross-cutting action lines such as uh, the integration of uh, the gender perspective, participation of vulnerable groups, but also um, different multi-stakeholder um, coordination aspects and um, education, uh, climate education, outreach. Um, so this allows us basically to, uh, to, to, uh, to develop integrated approaches that support green transformation from a broader perspective. Um, and currently, of course, with the post-COVID uh, uh, pandemic uh, uh, agenda, we um, we also developing uh, co concepts such as tra like concepts such as tra just transition play quite an important role. Um, finally, uh, I just want to briefly flag out one uh, even more concrete example of uh, one particular action that we are currently developing in Ecuador. So if we could just go one to the last slide. Um, so as a contribution to the NDC Partnerships Multi-Donor Economic Advisory Initiative, um, I don't know if you can switch to go to the next slide, please. Great, thanks. Um, so uh, we, Euroclima is currently providing support to the government of Ecuador to develop approaches for a green recovery. Um, and this uh, particular action is coordinated very closely between the finance and the environment ministries of Ecuador and responds to a request that had been submitted by the government to support the country to deal with the social, economic and political consequences of the COVID crisis and to consider climate concerns within their recovery measures. So, what are we doing? Um, we are now uh, supporting um, uh, an analysis of the economic impacts of COVID uh, on the priority sectors for climate change in Ecuador and of the potential impacts of economic recovery measures on the NDC implementation. And based on this, um, a strategy and implementation plan will be developed for green recovery that also integrates the sectorial and subnational perspectives of the country. And then in turn, these strategic instruments are, uh, are expected to provide the necessary guidance to identify concrete investment opportunities in um, green recovery. So also as additional reference documents, if anyone, anyone is interested, I can also post the links in the chat. Um, I have uh, included this, uh, this, this, slide, this link to our document series, Green Recovery for Practitioners, which um, provides some key arguments and practical examples for green recovery, um, working directly with those uh, counterparts in the, in the, in the different um, countries. So I think with this, uh, I would uh, stop here and uh, thank you once again for inviting me and look forward to exchange. Thanks Thank very much, Sylvia, for that very informative and fun. We got to at least some positive um, points about um, uh, seeing at least some attempts to ensure that the people affected, the people whose lives are being changed by actions are actually involved and engaged in the decision making. Um, which perhaps uh, might be sort of hinting at a possible uh, answer to the third question which we're putting to the members of the audience. And I think we've had some really interesting discussion and some suggested resources shared in the chat. So if anyone isn't looking at that, it's well worth having a look at that. I'll try and pull out some points and some issues raised there in a second. Um, but there's lots there to have a look at that I won't have time to get to at all. But in the meantime, um, the question being put to everyone, if you'd like to share some thoughts in the chat, is how should politicians improve international cooperation and climate finance at COP26? So that's a very explicit um, question addressed to uh, something that's happening in little more than a month's time. I think we must be somewhere around about 38 or 37 days to go until COP starts, I think, which is a slightly scary thought. Um, I know there's still an enormous amount hanging out there in the air and indeed I was talking to some uh, people about uh, media coverage and saying don't expect it to finish on the second Friday, it never finishes on the second Friday, so we'll see how we go. So questions, comments there to go into the chat, but just to pull together where we've been, we've covered an awful lot of ground in quite a short period of time, but I think it's um, 
to sort of start with um, Jonathan's presentation, I think it's worth looking back on that. And I very often um, say that everyone's talking green now. And um, that was a, a complaint made to me by a right wing uh, talk show host said very grumpily. But I think when you look at some of the um, the international investment institutions, they're not so much talking green as making a small nod to being green. And we might want to think about how we actually push those institutions, what the levers are to make them move faster and better. And COP26 is perhaps an answer to one of those. Um, moving on to Dorothy's presentation, I think what was in there was also a, um, a focus on the need to talk about more than just climate here. Um, the climate is in the condition it's in mostly because of the global north that the world is in the condition it is because of um, centuries of, of colonialism, of exploitation, of corruption in the global north. Um, and the issue of reparations does have to be included here, I think. And on that line, just to throw in, in a nice positive thing, if people haven't seen this, um, they, I woke up this morning to the news that overnight that the Daintree rainforest in North and Northern Australia um, is going to be essentially handed back to the control of the traditional Aboriginal Indigenous owners, um, which is one small positive step in a, a land that's in a continent that's been subject to genocide and massive environmental and human destruction. And then Sylvia, I think, really focused on one of the key takeaways that I suspect looking at the discussion from everything we've heard already, we're going to get from tonight is the crucial nature of the production, you might even say the co-production of climate finance. This is something that has to be done by people working together and absolutely a forefront have to be the people affected, the people who actually know what's needed in local areas. And that perhaps ties back to my um, Daintree comment and the need to involve indigenous people wherever possible who hold a great deal of knowledge and understanding um, of the natural world, of the interaction of humans with the natural world and how that can operate better. So that's my very um, brief summary. Um, thank you very much to three speakers, it's been absolutely brilliant this evening and got an enormous amount of information and been very disciplined on time. Thank you very much to all the participants who have really taken, I think, sparkling, I think would be a good word for the quality of the chat uh, and the discussion that's been happening in the chat and the questions. So thank you very much, everyone. Have a good evening and um, all the best and see you at another meeting somewhere around the copy, either physically uh, or on the screen. Thank you very much.